Welcome. I am Lou Ignaro, Nobel Laureate in Medicine and Chair of the Scientific Committee on Dialogues Beyond Borders, presented by the Menrini International Foundation. Today, I am pleased to present our interview with Professor Doug Feldberg from the Tel Aviv University School of Medicine in Israel. Professor Feldberg is president of the Israeli Society of Psychosomatic Obstetrics and Gynecology and vice president of the International Society for Gender Medicine. In this interview, Professor Feldberg will discuss how male and female infertility can be caused by changes in lifestyle, such as stress. He also explains the importance of epigenetic effects on fetal development. I hope you enjoy this interview. Welcome, Professor Dov Feldberg, Helen Schneider Hospital for Women uh, Rabin Medical Center in Tel Aviv, University School of Edison. Israel. Uh, this is Dialogues Beyond Borders, uh, organized by Fondazione Internazionale Minarini, and we are talking about perspectives, but also limits of science and research. So, welcome. My first question is about uh, artificial reproduction techniques, because you are a world expert in this field. And I think that we are using them more and more often. Do you think that we have a problem in, in conceiving naturally? That, do you see a surge in, in male or uh, female infertility around the world? I think it, it's, it is an excellent uh, question and uh, the answer is not so easy. In general, if we're taking the humanity, let's say, for the last 50 years, we see that several parameters indicate that infertility is starting to be a bigger, a bigger problem, especially male There is a laboratory in Paris doing for the last 50 years sperm analysis exactly in the same technology, light microscopy and uh, technically the same procedure. They've shown that in the last 50, 50 years, the quality of the sperm of the men in Paris dropped in 50%. So if you are, uh, you are analyzing the results, you, we have several reasons. First of all, I think life changed absolutely. The stress, the lifestyle, the alcohol, the drugs, and even the cosmic radiation and the heating, the global heat. Everything is influencing on our city. So, uh, and it's not only in Paris, it's all over the, the world. If we are taking the indications for IVF, assisted reproductive technology in the world, between 65 and 70% it's male infertility. So if in the past we blamed always the woman, today we have to blame ourselves. So it's an absolutely different story. In terms of female fertility, part of the problems were solved, like venereal diseases, like gonorrhea and some other diseases, uh, mechanical factors from all these uh, infectious diseases like blocking of the tubes and so on. But I think that the stress of life and the way of life and what we call lifestyle causes sorts of infertility, I would call it hypothalamic infertility, or infertility that actually comes from the brain, uh, high centers and so on. And we have more and more unexplained it. So the woman is fine, the sperm analysis is good, the extra of the uterus is fine, but still she's not going to get. And if you drop the stress, she's getting pregnant very quickly. So in these days, it became more and more uh, the obvious and more and more standable. And uh, we actually have all kinds of epigenetic changes that the action that this meeting is touching them very profoundly that we couldn't understand before. And these epigene epigenetic changes, again, they can influence fertility, get, they can influence all kinds of pathology of the pregnancy, like what we call monoplegnancy. I recall uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, chromosomal aberration and so on. So I think that all these factors all together, they show that there is increase in infertility. The diagnostics is much better. What we couldn't find 50 years ago, we can find easily today. And the availability of the assisted reproduction increased dramatically in the last 50 years. And Louise Brown was, four, was born in 1978, the first IPF child. Today she is nearly 50. So the technology is all around. 
And, and as I presented it this morning, 12 and a half million children over the world were born for, from this technology. So all these factors together bring us to deal more and more with the children. You told that there are two million Zama babies. Twelve and a half million. Twelve. Twelve and a half Twelve million. Twelve and a half million. million all over the world. Do they have any health risk? Did you study this? My lecture was actually this morning about the health of the ART children, the children post ART. They unfortunately did. There are some epigenetic changes and syndromes that actually are more uh, intensive presented in IPF babies. So we do believe that might be that. Uh, Cancer, especially hematological cancer, is more frequent in IVF babies. There's some other diseases, uh, actually, and even the congenital malformations, what we call the major congenital malformations. The child is born with malformations. So after they are ART, it was presented that there is increase in all these malformations and presenting syn uh, syndromes and symptoms. We do believe that maybe the technology causes all these changes during the selection of the sperm, during the selection of the oocyte, during culturing the fertilized egg in the laboratory system. They have all kinds of epigenetic influences that finally can cause these diseases. And these diseases, not only they are discovered immediately after the delivery of the child. Sometimes they have a, 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 a presentation later in their life, in uh, 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 ages 40, 50, as diabetes, cardiac disease, and the vascular disease, and so on. There's a big, big issue and discussion in the literature about autism. Autism and children are born after ART. And there are studies that actually claim that they have more autism, they are studying that claim that they don't, and their book is not written yet. But there are many problems and many debates today that this technology brought us into the reality and we have to confront and we'll decide. Because we must take care about the children that we so are struggling to breed them by our treatments, but they should be healthy. So talking about boundaries and limits uh, not to, to be crossed, uh, do you think that we have any ethical issues when dealing with our ART? I think ART is 50% medicine and 50% psychology, psychiatry, ethics, and all the social problems. So I do think we have many. Ethical problems are actually different in various countries. Muslims countries, Jewish country, Christian country, every religious religion has its own ethical approach to all these uh, uh, technologies, especially here in, here in Italy, Vatican, and so on. So we have many, many ethical problems, especially, especially, let's say, in egg donation. We are doing a lot of egg donation for elderly women. Till what age we should transfer the embryo? The low limits in Israel till 54. And before, women of 60 and 64, 65 used to deliver after egg donation. Is it ethical? Is it normal? Is it not ethical? From her point of view, it's ethical because she was a child and she deserved a child. But for the society, for the child, for the mental health of the child, having, having mother, grandmother, is it ethical or not? So these are big, big issues that every country is struggling to answer with their regulation, with their law, and their ethical committee for assisted reproduction. What about freezing techniques, it, embryos or um, eggs, uh, sperm? Are they safe enough? Do they pose any uh, ethical questions, issues? Usually, till now, we didn't know if uh, vitrification and all the technologies of prior preservation they cause any damage to the oocytes or to the embryos. And you know that there today is social freezing. Many elderly women in the world, they uh, quite preserve their eggs if they don't have a partner. They want sort of insurance, biological insurance, at the age of 34, 35, because she doesn't know when she's going to get married and she can naturally breed children. So at least this uh, she's, uh, she would like to have. Now, vitrification is a very well established uh, system of cryopreservation. But recently we have some publications of investigating the embryos that are cryopreserved and told in terms of all kinds of epigenetic implications. We know today that frozen embryos cause a bigger birth weight of the child. So if the same mother is going under in vitro fertilization, 
and she is transferred first embryo as she is delivering. Her, bo her boy or, or a girl would be three kilos to 100, three kilos 400, average uh, weight of the baby. But if she is after cryopreserve, it's going to be in 25-30% more the weight of the baby. Why? The same genetics, the same mother, the same sperm, the same head. So maybe the cryopreservation process, the vitrification, does some epigenetic changes. It's not harming the child, he's born bigger, but we do not still know all the implications. But you know, it's like uh, everything in medicine. If you are going to a hospital and you have an appendicitis and you are going to read the, the form that you have to sign, what complications can be for some, from some, such simple operation as a, a appendicitis, you'll take yourself in, around uh, run away from the hospital. Somebody has to take the responsibility. So our patients in Israel, all over the world, they are signing informed consent that they are taking into consideration that might be that the children that are going to be born for this, from this assistant or productive technologies, they are going to have A, B, C, and so on. But believe me, most couples are taking this risk. They are going because it's much better to have this small uh, percentage of complications instead of having a child. So most of the couples in the world who will sign and will go for it. But there is no uh, question that there are many ethical and moral problems around this technology. Um, just my, my last question. So the key word for the future is ep epigenetic. The key word for the future is epigenetics. I do believe it's epigenetics. And we are progressing more and more in epigenetic studies. And it's not only the moral and ethical questions about first generation, because epigenetics most probably strives transgeneration. Should they investigate the second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation? The, we do not know. There are no answers, exact answers, because the technology is not so many years and not so many ge generations were investigated. Some animal studies <clears throat> that were shown today and in general show that that it is a transgenerational epigenetic change. So I am sure that some of the epigenetic marks are going to be transgenerational, and maybe later uh, in the second or third generation, they are going to be expressed like diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, or some other diseases, maybe uh, neurological diseases. We do not know all the spectrum of the diseases, but it's no question that it's transgeneration and epigenetic is a real fantastic and great factor in the uh, vision of, of all this new technology and the approach for the treatment and the children that are going to be born. Thank you, Professor Fenberg. You are most welcome. Thank you. Yeah.